Now we need to review your antiderivatives or your integrals. And so uh, I'll focus more on the indefinite integrals uh, and then you should easily be able to switch that over by doing definite integrals. Uh, but the big thing here was the antiderivative concept and how to find an antiderivative for a given function. And it was really just reversing your derivatives. So in this case here, if you look at this example, uh, definition of antiderivative, a function capital F is an antiderivative of lowercase f on an interval i if f prime of capital F okay, equals f of x. And you can get twisted with all these capitals and lower cases. But the idea is basically this. If I'm going to do the integral of some function f of x with respect to x, capital F is that antiderivative. Now, why? Why is that? Sorry, plus c. Why is that? Because this here is the derivative of this function. Okay? And so when you're doing an integral, you're basically saying, here's my derivative. What is this the derivative of? And so some of them are very simple. If I go, say, the integral of, say, 2x dx, uh, you know that 2x is the integral of x squared, okay? Or the derivative, sorry, 2x is the derivative of x squared. So x squared is the integral of 2x. Now, we put the plus c on there, you all know, because x squared plus 1's derivative would be 2x. x squared plus 2's derivative would be 2x. And so x squared plus any constant's derivative, if I took the derivative of this, I would get 2x. So we have the c, which is the constant of integration, which then creates what we call a family of antiderivatives. But generally the idea is by saying I'm staring at a derivative, I need to go back. Now this isn't as easy. Derivatives are pretty straightforward. There's a rule, you apply the rule, you get your answer. Integrals are a little bit more of a puzzle. Uh, if you have your derivative rules memorized, and this is really important, and I keep saying this uh, when we talk about derivatives, is that if you have your derivative rules memorized, it makes it easier for us to recognize that we're looking at the derivative of some function and what function that is the derivative of to go backwards. So we look at some of our basic derivative rules and try and work them backwards to find our integration. And some of them are harder than others, and we start to learn some of our techniques of integration, which we will do a lot more this semester. Um, this semester we focus a lot of, on, on integration, uh, and uh, we need to build on what we learned in Calc 1. So again, just like your derivative rules should be memorized, your integration rules also need to be memorized. So we have some basic differentiation rules um, that we looked at previously. And so the idea of integration is to go backwards. Uh, Anti-differentiation is to go backwards. And so some rules are very easy to go backwards from. So here's a list of some really simple ones to go back for, backwards from. And so first, let's say we have the derivative of a constant. We know that the derivative of a constant is zero. So then if I start with zero and I take the integral of zero, I should get back to a constant. We know that the derivative of some constant times x should be that constant k. So if I then take the antiderivative of some constant with respect to x, I should get kx plus c. And so the idea with all these is we're going to start here and we're going to go back to that. Uh, if you look at this next one, this was the constant multiple rule. So we knew that the constant multiple could get pulled outside of the derivative. And then we can just take the derivative of the function itself. Well, if I'm going to do this with integration, it should really work the same way because then I would just work with this function and multiply the constant back in again. So essentially, I could pull the constant multiple outside of integrals as well. Sum and difference rule, we could take the derivative of this one and the derivative of this one separately and then add them together. Well, that should work the same way with integrals. I take the integral of each one separately, then add them together as long as it's with respect to the same variable x in both cases. Power rule, if you look at your power rule, you would take the derivative of the power rule, you would bring that power out to the front, the new power is one less. But we have to reverse that, we have to kind of work our way backwards. So now if we're starting with x to a power, <coughs> we have to add one to the power. 
And instead of bringing that power out to the front, we have to divide by that new power. In which case, this actually undoes what we did over here. And so this is our new power rule for integration, where we add one to the power and divide by the new power, then plus C. Notice, N can't be equal to negative one. If N was equal to negative one here, then this would be negative one plus one, negative one plus one. And you would have x to the 0 over 0, which you can't happen. So this power rule for integration applies as long as n doesn't equal negative 1. If n is negative 1, that would be the same thing as talking about the integral of 1 over x dx, which we're going to mention down here in a second. Uh, probably one of the easiest ones here is that we know that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So then that if we go backwards, the integral of e to the x would also be e to the x plus c on all these, obviously. Uh, and then the last one, you know the derivative of your log is 1 over x. So now here's where we take the integral of 1 over x. This is the same thing as x to the negative 1. This is not a power rule situation. As long as x is not negative one, we could use this power rule. But in this case, we can't because we saw we would get x to the zero over zero, which doesn't make any sense. That's because this one, if we go backwards from the derivative rule, would give us the logarithm, plus c on the end, as with all of them. Right, the best thing for us to do is to see these things in action. So let's look at this first one, the integral of three x dx. Well, the 3 is a constant multiple, which can be pulled out. So I'm really just taking the integral of x dx. Now that's x to the first power. So that's a power rule problem. So we saw that what we should do is in order to integrate x to a power, as long as that power is not negative 1, which it isn't, we should add 1 to the power and then divide by whatever that new power is, throw a plus c on the end, which ultimately gives us this 3, again, constant multiples just sitting out there, 3x squared over 2 plus c. Now, if you have questions of whether or not this is going to work, remember, now you can check to see if this is, in fact, the antiderivative of this function by taking the derivative of this. If you took the derivative of this, what would you do? You take the power, pull it out to the front, and subtract 1 from the power. Well, if that power comes out to the front, it would cancel with this 2, and the new power will be 1. So I still have the 3 there, and I have x to the first, which is exactly what this is. So you see, it works. Next one, similar to things we did with differentiation, I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to rewrite this as x to the negative 3 dx because the power rule doesn't apply to 1 over x to a power. It only applies specifically to x to a power. In this case now, looking at this x to the negative 3, I could apply the power rule to it. As long as the power is not negative 1, it's not. If it's negative 3. I can say this will be x to the negative 3 plus 1 over negative 3 plus 1 plus c, which would give me x to the negative 2 over negative 2 plus c. Best way to write this would be negative 1 over 2x squared plus c. <coughs> Final one, I'll rewrite it as x to the 1 half. Again, another power rule. Uh, if I take the antiderivative, I have to add 1 to the power and divide by that new power. So what you see here is we end up with x to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves plus c. If we're dividing by a fraction, we need to remember to flip and multiply. So it's actually times 2 thirds. And there's your answer. Here's another one. Uh, this one is usually one that gives people some trouble, but uh, think about this. They go, well, what am I supposed to integrate? There can always be a 1 here, so 1 dx. So you ask yourself, what did I take the derivative of to get 1? Well, x, right? The derivative of x is 1. Throw a plus c on the end, and there's your answer. Uh, integral of x plus 2. This is added, so I use the sum and difference rules. Derivative, integral of x plus 2 integral of 2 dx. So here you're going to get x squared over 2 plus 2x plus c. And you see that's going to definitely work. If you're not sure, take the derivative of this and you'll get back to x plus 2. 
So we basically have a very easy way of working with polynomials here. So if I look at this next one, I can do the integral of 3x to the fourth minus the integral of 5x squared dx dx plus the integral of x dx. They're all with respect to x. And so the 3 can come out. So I really just have x to the fourth dx minus the 5 can come out. I have x squared dx and then I have x dx. What I have here are basically three power rule problems. So I end up with 3x to the fifth over 5 minus 5x to the third over 3 plus x squared over 2 plus c. And there's my antiderivative. Again, not sure. Take the derivative of this. Here's a couple more. Again, a little bit harder now. Uh, notice that when we went through those basic rules for integration, uh, where we were just reversing some of those derivative rules, there was no product or quotient rule that we reversed. Because thinking about trying to reverse the product rule or the quotient rule, that would be fairly difficult to do uh, in working the derivative rule of a product rule or quotient rule backwards. So when it comes to these antiderivatives, these definite in these indefinite integrals, uh, there is no product rule or quotient rule. So here I have to integrate a quotient. How am I going to do it? Well, what I'm going to do is not actually integrate a quotient. I'm going to rewrite this function a little bit. So first thing I'm going to do is write this as x plus 1 over x to the 1 half dx. Then I'm going to do a trick that we've used for derivatives as well. I'm going to say x over x to the 1 half plus 1 over x to the 1 half. Split that numerator apart. Then I'm going to simplify each fraction. So x over x to the 1 half is x to the 1 half. And this one I'm going to bring up and write this as x to the minus 1 half. And now what you have are two things added together so I can integrate each one of these separately. And they're both power rule problems. So what do I end up with? I end up with x to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves means multiplied by 2 thirds. Plus this will be x to the 1 half divided by 1 half means multiplied by 2 plus c. There's my answer. You go to the next one. Don't think that this is a power rule, which would be the most common mistake. I could pull the two out. A lot of people go, okay, x to the negative one, bring it up like we've done with the previous ones. But then the problem is they go, okay, let's do power rule. But you see, this is the one where you can't do power rule. So you go, okay, well, how am I going to do this? But remember, x to the negative one, one over x, they're the same thing. And you're asking yourself, what is this the derivative of? Well, we know that that's the derivative of a logarithm. So the answer for this is 2 natural log of x plus c. Now, there's two ways to write that. You can write as 2 natural log of x plus c, but you can also write 2 natural log of absolute value of x. Because remember, what we saw was that the derivative of log x, as well as the derivative <coughs> of natural log of absolute value of x, both equaled 1 over x. And so... If I'm going backwards, I can go backwards to either of these. Now, if we go with this one, this is a little bit more of a stronger function in that this function contains this function plus more. So in this case, while if you didn't put the absolute value on this, you would be correct. Putting the absolute value is a little bit of a stronger answer. Let's do another one. So I'm going to rewrite this one as the integral of 3x squared dx minus the integral of 7e to the x dx. The better you get at this, the less of these steps you write out. But at first, we're going to write all these out. The 3 is going to come out. I just have x squared dx. The 7 is going to come out. I just have e to the x dx. And so this is a power rule, and this is an exponential one. So I get 3x cubed over 3 minus 7e to the x. Integral of e to the x is e to the x because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. I can cancel these two threes, and so I get x cubed minus 7 e to the x plus c as my antiderivative. And as with derivatives, again, then there's the trigonometric function integrals. And again, it's just reverse of your derivative rules, which makes it so important to have your rules memorized. If you have your derivative rules memorized, then these integrals will be very easy. So the integral of cosine we should know is going to be 
sine of x plus c, uh, the integral of secant squared. Again, all you're doing is saying this is the derivative of what function? And secant squared is the derivative of tan, so the integral of secant squared should be tan x plus c. Secant x plus tan x, same thing. This is going to be secant x plus c. Uh, cosecant squared, uh, we should know as the derivative of cotangent, but we're missing the negative, so we just put the negative here on the answer for the integral, so negative cotangent x. Um, then we have cosecant times cotangent, and cosecant times cotangent is negative cosecant x plus c. Uh, sine, let's move down to this one, we know it's going to be minus cosine x. You just got to remember to put the minus on there. I think that's the only thing people would mess up there. And then we have these other four trigonometric functions. Now, the integral of secant, that's actually harder to do than the integral of secant squared. Because secant squared is a derivative you should know. You should know that that's the derivative of tangent. But secant itself is a little bit trickier. And this is where you learned your logarithms, um, and then you were able to do these. And so, so the integral of secant x is going to be a log of the absolute value of secant x plus tan x plus c. And tan, same idea here. Uh, to do, say, like the derivative of secant x times tan x is definitely easier than just tan itself. Uh, this is going to be another logarithm, so the logarithm of, um, or minus the logarithm of cosine x, uh, which also sometimes we see as the logarithm of the secant of x. And the reason why that happens, and this is probably more likely you're going to see this one, but the reason why the log of secant happens is because if we bring this negative inside the logarithm using log rules, secant, uh, cosine to the negative 1 was really the reciprocal of cosine, the reciprocal of cosine is secant. Then there's the integral of the cosecant, which is going to be minus the log of cosecant x cotan plus cotangent x. You can throw the plus c because these are all indefinite integrals. The integral of cotangent x is going to be the log of sine x. And uh, the best thing to do is to memorize these. So I would, again, make some index cards up and flip through them periodically, and you will get these things memorized. And the more you have this stuff memorized, calculus 2 will become so much easier. And then there's the big one, the substitution method of integration. This is just the reverse of your chain rule, essentially. Uh, derivative rule uh, of chain rule, we know. Uh, and if we're going to take the derivative uh, of a composition function, chain rule allows us to do this. And this is just reversing that. And so the idea here is a couple of ways I can write this. One way I can write it is if I wrote this as f prime and I wrote this as f, this would look exactly like um, your chain rule in reverse. This is the derivative you would get after you apply the chain rule. So if I integrate that, it should go back to the function for which that is the derivative of, which would be f of g of x here. Now, I don't have that necessarily in this slide because my notation that I'm using is capital F and lowercase f. Remember, capital F is the antiderivative of F itself, so it's the same thing as saying this is F prime and this is lowercase f. Right? So either way, this, it, it's the same thing, uh, it's just changing the notation. But anyway, the idea of how you arrive at this is fairly complicated unless you split it apart with your substitution. You know, realizing that when you have an integral that looks like this, there are three functions going on here. There's f, there's g, and there's g prime. So we're integrating something that has three functions that make it up. But when you get the answer, the only real part that you have to worry about integrating is the f component, okay? Because you have to integrate f and find the antiderivative of f. It's 
far as G and G prime goes, G prime is not needed for the answer, and G itself just swaps over and comes right in here. So realizing that while this is made up of three functions, the only real thing you need to integrate is F and this replace G back in here, uh, you can simplify this, and that's what the substitution does. So if we take G and pull it out and just call it U, and then the derivative of U, which is DU, is G prime, this whole big integral here that has all this going on in it really just turns into the integral of f of u du. And so you go, oh, well, if that's just f of u du, I just integrate f and I'm, I'm done. And so it's all about pattern recognition, okay? And, and writing down your substitution, I think, is a pretty big key that you learned about this. So here, if you realize that this function and this function are related through derivatives, in that if I let u equal x squared plus 1, the derivative of u would be 2x. Now, normally what we would do is this. We would say, okay, the derivative of u with respect to x equals 2x. Basic Leibniz notation. Okay, this is your simple concept from you learned in the beginning of Calc 1 of derivatives. But what we do instead is we take this dx and we move it over to the other side of the equation by multiplying, because it's divided here, we multiply it, so we write this as du equals 2x dx. Now, why we do that is because when we go to integrate it, we need to substitute things out. All the x's have to be replaced with some kind of u. And what you learned is that you don't just take a dx out and turn it into a du. dx and du are not directly equal to each other, and that's what this equation is telling you. That du doesn't equal dx. du equals 2x dx. And so this dx, well... You know, lots of times people sort of ignore it and just say, oh, it just tells me what variable they're integrated with respect to. It's pretty important when it comes to the substitution. You can't just swap a dx out and put du there and, and think you're all good. Because this says that that's not the case, that du equals 2x dx, not just dx itself. So anyway, this 2x and this dx both come out and get replaced with a du. This x squared plus 1 comes out and just replaces with a u. That was raised to the fourth power. So you notice that, okay, this integral looks a lot easier. And that's what the idea of here to here is. Get rid of all the stuff you don't need to look at. Just look at the one function you need to integrate, which is really the power function here. And then do your integration using your power rules. So you add 1 and divide by, so u to the fifth over 5 plus c. Then the key is, okay, once you make a substitution, you've got to go back and resubstitute. So then I'm going to resubstitute this the fact that u equals x squared plus 1, and my answer is going to be x squared plus 1 to the fifth over 5 plus c. This one's the same idea, recognizing that I have a function and that function's derivative. I'm talking about, if I go all the way back to here, just make it so you see it, I have a g and a g prime. That's the stuff we're going to remove so we can focus on the f. So this is my g, this is my g prime. So I'm going to let u equal the g. du is going to be the derivative of that, which is 3x squared dx. Again, the dx for the same reason as before. So this piece right here is my du. This is my u. So ultimately, I have the integral of u to the 1 half du. And power rule, add 1, divide by, so you get uh, what u to the 3 halves times 2 thirds plus c, substitute your u back in, and you're good to go, 2 thirds times x cubed plus 1 to the 3 halves plus c. Now through integration, there's a few tricks you learned along the way. Uh, and you continue to learn. That's a big part of Calculus 2 is, is learning new ways of integration. Uh, but one little trick which you picked up through derivatives and also works in integrals is to try and split a fraction apart. And split the numerator apart is fairly easy to do. Uh, I can split this apart into three separate fractions here. And what that allows me to do is to write this as three separate integrals, right? The integral of e to the 3x over 2x minus three e to the two x over e to the two x. Uh, let me fix this. This is e to the two x uh, plus e to the x over e to the two x. 
and this is all dx. And then I can simplify each one of these fractions. And so I have, this just becomes e to the x by using basic exponent rules. This will just be 3 because e to the 2x will cancel. And then this one will be e to the minus x. And once I get to that point, then it's really easy since they're added and subtracted. I can integrate each one separately. This would give me e to the x. This would give me 3x. And this would give me minus e to the minus x. Throw plus c, and we're done. Now, the reason why this one turned out to be e to the minus x is really through substitution. If I was to integrate e to the minus x dx, that's not e to the x, which we know is e to the x. It's e to the minus x. So what we need to do is we need to turn it into something we know how to integrate. So we would say, all right, let's let u equal, say, um, negative x. du would just be minus 1 throw the dx over to that side. Now we don't have the minus one anywhere in here. I have this is coming out. I need a minus one dx. Well, rather than do that, what I'll do is I'll move this minus one over to the other side by dividing by it. And so now I just have the dx should be replaced with a negative one times du. And so I'm gonna end up with pulling that negative one all the way out to the front because it is a constant multiple e to the u du. And so now I have e to the u du, which is just like e to the x dx, and so that integral will be e to the u, but I have this extra negative out here, and that's where the minus comes from. So replace your u with your negative x, so e to negative e to the negative x, and you're good to go. Uh, this one, same idea, pattern recognition, here's u, here's the derivative of that. So in this case, u equals x to the fourth plus x. du is 4x cubed plus 1 dx. And you see that you end up with 4x cubed plus 1 dx is du over u. And this has the form of your basic logarithm. So you end up with log u plus c, replace your u, and you get log of x to the fourth plus x plus c. Uh, 